First, we're delighted that you all are here today. Thank you so much for coming to this annual Memory and Aging Project participants meeting and breakfast. This is um, one of many such breakfasts that we've had. Many of you have been to several of them. I would tell you uh, which one this is, but I forget, so I can't. Don't know how many we've had. Uh, but seriously, we are so delighted that you're here. And uh, we have a very uh, hopeful, very informative uh, program for you here today. Just some uh, housekeeping uh, matters. So if you have a mobile device, will you please turn it off or put it on vibrate? Second, uh, if you need the necessary rooms, I think they're outside this room and to the left. And third, uh, each table hopefully has one clicker. Krista is showing you what it looks like because we're going to have a little bit of trivia and each table should have one person who responds uh, to the trivia questions. Does anybody, is any table missing a clicker? All right. Okay, then finally, uh, at your table also uh, are uh, pens and cards. Uh, as we go along uh, in the presentation today, if people uh, have questions that they would like to have addressed, we're going to ask that you write it down on that index card. And at the end of the presentations, we'll have a panel here, and we'll try to answer as many of the questions. We'll, we'll come around and collect them from each table. Uh, try to answer as many questions as we possibly can. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That's great. All right. So this is um, our Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center uh, faculty and staff. It is a, a remarkable group of individuals. It is a real honor, privilege for me to be able to be the director of such a wonderful group of individuals, and many of them are here today, and almost all of them have been uh, uh, instrumental in preparing uh, this participant's breakfast. It's not a trivial task. You look around, we have over 400 people here, uh, and it takes lots of planning. Uh, we do have a, uh, a um, a goal for everything that we do, and that is we want to do it in a terrific, excellent, and wonderful manner, so it's a high bar for us to reach. Uh, I want to, as I say, the entire staff of the Memory and Aging Project has contributed. I want to highlight uh, Ron Hawley, who has put together the audiovisual uh, portion of the uh, program today. Uh, Renee Labarge, who has been uh, very helpful in getting uh, all the organizational details done. But it always falls to one individual to be the person in charge, and standing in the back is Angela Oliver. She's raising her hand. She did the whole thing, more or less. So let's give her a round of applause. Now, um, if you are a, a Memory and Aging Project faculty member, or a staff person, would you please stand at this point? Everyone stand, please. Everybody stand. Stay standing. Stay standing. So they deserve that round of applause. They are terrific, as I said. But now, Okay, they deserve two rounds of applause. But now I'd like all of us in the Memory and Aging Project to turn to our participants and let's give them our thanks for being our participants. All right, you may, you may be seated. Thanks to our dedicated volunteers. Uh, for your information, we've had uh, uh, some uh, people who have been in the Memory and Aging Project move on to other positions, and we've added some individuals uh, as well, and they're listed here. I've, uh, we've bracketed Becky Cusinelli and Nicole Elmore because 
Um, they are joining us later this month. They're not here uh, yet, but within the past year, we've had uh, these individuals join us, and uh, we're really delighted to have them. We have many partners in, uh, in our Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center work. Uh, for uh, three or more decades, we've partnered with the St. Louis chapter of the Alzheimer's Association, and we're delighted to have them here. There's uh, Cheryl Kenny is here, and, and Stacy did I see? Yeah, Stacy's in the back, and Cheryl Kenny is here from the Alzheimer's Association. We thank them. Our African American Advisory Board, and I'll talk more about that as we go along. Uh, they've been a wonderful partner for us, and they've introduced us to the St. Louis chapter of Lynx Incorporated. It's been very you know, beneficial for our program. Uh, on the Washington University side, we uh, deal uh, productively with the Harvey A. Friedman Center for Aging and the Hope Center for Neurologic Disorders. And we've partnered with uh, Barnes Jewish Hospital Foundation, including uh, Tina Hissong, uh, to uh, enable donors to uh, help uh, pro uh, support our program. I have to say that, of course, I'm biased if uh, we didn't find Washington University to be a conducive place to do our research, we'd move on to another uh, institution, but it has been terrific. And uh, this starts with the Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Wrighton, the Dean of the School of Medicine, David Perlmutter, and the Department uh, of Neurology Chair, Dr. David Holtzman. They've been just tremendous. We've also had great support from uh, the Washington University Alumni and Development Program who have helped us um, connect with uh, donors and friends of the program. And uh, the reason it's called the Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Program is we've had a long-standing, very generous support from Charles and Joanne Knight. And Mrs. Knight is here today. She's raising her hand. Thank you very much. And also uh, from Daniel Brennan, who has uh, been here from just coming here. He doesn't live in St. Louis. He's on his way home to Boston, but he's coming back from Turkey and decided to come here today to join us for our participants meeting. Isn't that wonderful? Mr. Brennan. We have many other very strong supporters. I'll mention the Brew family, uh, Roger and Paula Riney, David and Betty Farrell, Fred Simmons and Olga Mohan, and uh, also uh, support from uh, Edwards Jones. And uh, this is particularly uh, interesting. Uh, for the past two years, I don't know how they found us, but a, a group of very committed uh, individuals from Henry County, Missouri, in western Missouri, uh, I think the county seat is Clinton, have uh, provided us uh, with their generous uh, support. And uh, two of them, at least, uh, traveled in from Clinton to come and join us tonight. So if they will stand, the Henry County Memory uh, Group. The program today is going to talk about the importance of our biomarker program. I'll describe it in just a moment, and these individuals will discuss how important the biomarkers are for the understanding of Alzheimer's disease and ultimately for identifying the optimal time that we can intervene in hopes of preventing Alzheimer's disease. So we're going to hear about collecting spinal fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF. We're going to discuss a unique program called the Stable Isolo isotope labeling kinetics program that is only done here, not done anywhere else. It's led by Randy Bateman. Uh, he has much input from Dr. Holtzman, our department chair, but mostly it's done here because of you. There are no other group of individuals who can really appreciate why it's important to do this study and then to sign up to volunteer to do it. You know that another major area of emphasis that we're, in, uh, that we're uh, pursuing is imaging Alzheimer's disease, and uh, Tammy Benzinger, our imaging core leader, is here to discuss uh, how uh, we're branching out from looking 
beyond Alzheimer's per se to other brain diseases such as vascular disease that can contribute to dementia. And we ha have what I term a cautiously optimistic view of investigational drugs to try to treat Alzheimer's disease that Dr. Joy Snyder will present. All right, so at this point we're going to do a trivia contest. So I'd like everybody to um, uh, find your table captain who has the clicker. Are you, are you coming up here? Okay, all right. Uh, so, so it seems, you know, you might think on, on the surface that Alzheimer researchers are a rather studious, maybe a dull lot of people, but that's not true. Matter of fact, one of us is noted for having a fire engine red Firebird car screeching in and out of our parking lot at all times of day. And so why don't you look here and tell us who you think was the owner of this fire engine red Firebird. I can't tell. Is it, is, is it responding? No, not yet, not yet, not yet. All right, you have 10 seconds if you haven't completed it. Five seconds. Done. All right. Okay, so John Morris, so you correctly noted how dashing and debonair I really am. But the correct answer is Terry Hosto. Where is Terry? Where's Terry? She, she's out running around in her firebird. All right, the next question. Uh, this, is a, this is really trivia, uh, but I, uh, you may not know that when you come to the Memory and Aging Project, it is of historic architectural significance. So we're asking, who do you think is the architect who designed that building? All right, you, could, you can go ahead. All right, you have 10 seconds. Five seconds. Done. Okay, your answer is split. The true answer is Harris Armstrong. <clears throat> now, we recently had someone from uh, the Sam Fox School of visual uh, arts and design uh, from the College of Architecture come and tell us about our building. Uh, Harris Armstrong was uh, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s considered the dean of St. Louis architecture. And uh, in the 30s, he put in a, a, a bid to design what now is the Gateway Arch. And Errol Saarinen, of course, is the architect for the arch, but the only uh, runner-up was Harris Armstrong, so he was really quite uh, quite renowned. Some of you may know on Clayton Road in Ladue, the Ethical Society, that Copper Dome, that's Harris Armstrong. So he has, he has many architectural gems. 
I don't know if our building is a gem, but, it's a, but it is significant. Okay, uh, our African American Advisory Board. I mentioned that. What year did we begin the African American Advisory Board? All right, go. So if we do this again, maybe I'll just cut it down a little bit. This is my third time, right? It's a good touch. You don't touch it too much. As many times it messes it up. All right, you have 10 seconds. Five. Okay, here are your responses. So, uh, 2005, the correct answer is 2000. Okay, final question. Uh, I, I should tell you, as I was uh, walking around meeting a number of you uh, this morning, that I got uh, some questions about whether I plan to retire. I'm 69 years of age. That's fair question. Uh, the answer is no. I mean, I will at some point, but I have no plans to retire. But I am very much interested in... Uh, training and developing a successor. So my future ADRC director likely will be my grandson. So, so I want you to let us know what you think his name is. By the way, uh, it's very possible I named him Alwas. It is Alwas Alzheimer who identified the first Alzheimer patient. So it's, it's possible All right, 10 seconds. Five seconds. Okay, so here's how you responded. Most of you said Jack, and the final answer is... So Jack's a little over two years, so I, I have a few more years before I'm ready to turn it over to him. So thank you for playing trivia with us. Um, you know, the purpose of this meeting, as we've already said, is to give you our appreciation for being our volunteers, and without you, we would not be here, simply, simply put. We also hope to... Uh, and we'll move now into this phase, provide you with information on our studies and what the reason is that we're doing them, what we hope to get out of them. But there's one other uh, facet of this meeting that I particularly enjoy, and I appreciate all of our volunteers for telling us that this is essential for this meeting, and the fact is that once a year, I get to have bacon. So, so, so thank you very much for insisting on bacon at our breakfast. All right, just to let you know how we operate, we're primarily funded through the National Institutes of Health, the government entity. 
made up of several institutes. One of them is the National Institute on Aging. So the National Institute on Aging funds our program through grants that we submit for consideration for funding, and they determine whether our application is meritorious. All of our participants' evaluations are held in that office building that you know is the Memory and Aging Project, or MAP. And the Memory and Aging Project serves for it to do the assessments of everyone, no matter what grant they're in. Matter of fact, I would imagine that the majority of people in this room don't know what grant they're enrolled under, but they know the Memory and Aging Project. Our four grants are the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. It began originally in 1985, so we're, in, we're now in 32nd uh, year. And it was endowed by Charles and Joanne Knight in 2010, so now it's the Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. A large grant that actually began a year before the Alzheimer's Center in 1984, led by my predecessor, Leonard Berg, called Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia. The Adult Children's Study began in 2005, and the Dominantly Inherited Alzheimer's Network began in 2008. Now, typically, if we're successful with our grant applications, we're given five years of funding. We have to let the grant reviewers know what it is we want to do, how we're going to do it, what the budget would be, and they have to agree with all of that. But they don't want us to have an unwritten check. So five years from now, we're going to have to renew whatever grant that we're in and ask for another five years of funding. It's not certain that our Alzheimer's Center will be refunded each time. There are many Alzheimer's Centers that began in 1984 and 1985 that have lost their funding. They were not deemed to give su sufficient progress or to propose sufficient science that they've been able to continue. But we've been very fortunate. We have had all of these grants, every time they've come up for renewal, to be successful, and we continue on. It's not a certainty, but it, it, it does testify to the uh, uh, wonderful group of investigators uh, that are in these grants. These grants are, uh, renewal applications are not trivial. Each application is about a thousand pages. The budgets are often over between 10 and 15 million. So they're big, big grants. Just notice, and the government, this is a surprise, doesn't work quickly. When we put in an application, we have to wait over a year to find out if we're going to have funding. So notice that next year for the Healthy Aging Senile Dementia Grant in January, we are, need to resubmit an application for funding so that when our current budget in that grant ends in April 2019, we have the new grant to allow us to continue uninterrupted. We've already started planning for that renewal application, but as soon as it goes in in January 2018, we have to start planning for the Diane renewal application. And as soon as that goes in, we have to start planning for the renewal application of the Alzheimer's Center, and then finally, the Adult Children's Center. It's a huge process, but it's essential for the continuation of our research. And our research, we think, is cutting edge, pioneering. We always are going to want to treat people who have the Alzheimer's disease dementia. Dr. Snyder will be talking about some current studies that target people with symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. But what is particularly important to us is we'd like to prevent people from getting the symptoms of Alzheimer's, from getting dementia. So we're trying to identify people before the symptomatic stage, when people are still perfectly fine in their memory and thinking, have no complaints, no deficits, but their brain is beginning to build up Alzheimer's lesions. So this is preclinical Alzheimer's disease. We, uh, 
are able to examine these lesions in living people through the use of biomarkers, which includes brain imaging and analysis of spinal fluid proteins. These, the, there are two questions that are unanswered at present. If people who have buildup of Alzheimer changes in the brain, does it mean that if they continue to live, that they all inevitably will develop dementia? We don't know the answer to that. And second, we'd like to know what are the signals that a person is transitioning from having Alzheimer lesions in the brain but still cognitively normal, no dementia, what triggers the onset of dementia? Seems to us to be very important to identify that because we want to intervene with our drugs at the most fruitful time to prevent dementia. So we, we, vol we pioneered prevention trials at Washington University. The first prevention trial of an anti-Alzheimer agent started in December 2012 under Dr. Bateman's leadership in the Diane study, but several others now have come along. Now, we talk about biomarkers. The biggest biomarker is one's memory and thinking ability. That's how we know if it's declining. That's how we know people are changing. You see on here this vertical line is when we expect in any one individual or group of individuals for symptoms to occur. That is when Alzheimer's dementia begins. So using our best clinical tools, trying to measure memory and thinking and how people are functioning in the environment, we can maybe get a signal that things are changing possibly five years prior to the actual diagnosis of dementia. And if we're a little more sophisticated with cognitive testing, memory testing in particular, maybe eight to nine to 10 years. But it's only, it's only signals, it's not definitive. But look at this, when we start doing our PET imaging, that's what PIB stands for, and we start measuring the protein tau in the spinal fluid, that gets us 15 years before we anticipate symptoms. And if we look at the other Alzheimer protein in the spinal fluid, amyloid beta, that may be going on 25 years before symptoms. So first, take home message, preclinical Alzheimer's is asymptomatic phase, the brain changes have started, but still no memory thinking, may last over two decades. Second, this gives us a clue, if we're going to understand it, what we need to focus on. And you can see, because we, we want to know in this whole course of over two decades, when is the optimal time to intervene with drugs. And I think you can see this underscores the importance of measuring the spinal fluid proteins because they're the first signal that something has gone on. It's critical for us to understand this entire cascade of changes. I'm gonna skip this slide. Uh, so detecting lesions during life, you know, how many of you have heard we don't know whether somebody has Alzheimer's until they die and the brain is examined under, under the microscope? We don't have to wait now. We can tell those same lesions in living people using imaging and uh, analysis of spinal fluid. And so we can do a brain autopsy during life. Uh, again, I, this is the third time I've mentioned cautious optimism for uh, intervening with drugs to attack the disease mechanism of Alzheimer's to delay or prevent Alzheimer's symptoms. We're going to talk about uh, a number of these studies in, in more depth with Dr. Snyder. Uh, but we use biomarkers to identify people who are cognitively normal, but at risk if they continue to live for developing Alzheimer's symptoms. And uh, now biomarkers are an integral part of all of these Alzheimer drug studies. <coughs> we are conducting four at present for older adults at the uh, Knight ADRC. Uh, I won't go into these because Dr. Snyder is going to talk about them in, in more length. We may be adding a fifth. So we're now very fully invested in testing the efficacy of drugs 
to try to prevent Alzheimer's dementia. Now I'm going to shift gears for just a moment. Um, you may know that our research clinicians in the uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center do your assessments when you come in. Also are practicing neurologists and psychiatrists and geriatricians and have their own clinic. Uh, those of us who uh, are in the uh, uh, neurology group have a clinic called the Memory Diagnostic Center. We see our private patients there. Uh, you also are, are aware, hopefully not from the Memory Diagnostic Center, but you know that it's a difficult time now for physicians to uh, spend all the time needed to address questions from patients and families. And we have felt that pressure in the Memory Diagnostic Center because Alzheimer's disease engenders lots of questions and we have established a, a full-time nurse who does nothing but answers phone calls from our patients and families. I mentioned our supporters earlier, and one of our supporters, Joanne Knight, who I've uh, introduced, also uh, contributes very generously to the St. Louis chapter of the Alzheimer Association. And she has uh, agreed to have uh, her funds go to support a new position at the St. Louis chapter, someone called a care consultant, who will be dedicated to serving the patients and families of memory diagnostic center uh, individuals to follow up where physicians can't about all the additional questions and advice and information and resources that people need. And uh, the St. Louis chapter has hired uh, Julie Whitley, a medical social worker who trained with Terry Hosto of the Firebird, uh, the Red, uh, Firebrick, Red, uh, Firebird. And, and, and Mrs. Mrs. Whitley already uh, is started and has already been a very valuable resource for our memory diagnostic patients and families. Julie, are you here? I didn't see if Julie came in. Now, uh, Julie is standing. She's waving her hand. Uh, please welcome Julie to our family. Well, let me tell you a little bit about yourself. So I mentioned we have these four grants. That means the number of participants in our study is about 850. If we look at people 65 and older, it's about 475. Adult children study people begin at age 45, about 270. And the dominantly inherited group begins at age 18, and that's 106 at Washington University. <coughs> age range goes from 18 to 101. So we're, exa we're examining the entire adult lifespan of individuals as to when the brain changes of Alzheimer's begin. 57% of our participants are women, 16% are African American. And people are extremely dedicated. Three of you have come in 29 consecutive times for your assessments. And you come from all over, including Idaho, Maine, California, Texas. Here's a combination of our older people, 65 and older, just to point out that 344 are cognitively normal. Only about 130 have symptomatic Alzheimer's. This reflects our scientific interest in that preclinical stage prior to the onset of Alzheimer's symptoms. Now, I've told you how wonderful you are. That is true. But I have to say that you are so wonderful that I think we ask, may be asking way too much of you. I, I mentioned that our budgets are very tightly geared to our research goals. That includes our clinical assessments. We're not given excess funds to make up things that we can't achieve. So we've noticed in the past three years that when we call and ask you to come in for your annual assessment, and you are scheduled, that almost uh, now, in this past year, almost 20% of the time, Sometimes on the day of the scheduled assessment, you call and say, I can't come. And essentially, we lose that assessment slot. We can't fill it again. So we have reduced our capacity to see the number of participants that we think we need to see to achieve our goals. Now, listen, there are 
clearly unavoidable reasons for canceling. People get ill, that's number one. Uh, you know, we get terrible snowstorms in January, that causes cancellations. But we think there are potentially avoidable questions, uh, reasons. And, uh, you know, a lot of the time you call back and say, oh, I forgot I had something else scheduled. But I think, and I'm concerned, that it may be that we ask, as I say, an awful lot of you to do things. And you may be getting tired of participating. So here are some participation rates in the procedures that I've pointed out to you are so important for identifying this preclinical phase of Alzheimer's disease. And remember, we're funded by the National Institutes on Aging to be a biomarker study. Our amyloid PET imaging was below 50% in 2015. It's up to about two-thirds in 2017, but it still means we're missing getting amyloid imaging on those of you who are eligible for it in about a third. Our spinal fluid collection is about 54 to 61%. So again, 40% of people were missing it. Brain MR and blood is better. But we're very concerned about the loss of completion of not only your clinical assessment, but these biomarker studies and what that means for our ability to do our science. One thing we can do is try to increase the amount of Assessors that we have, clinicians, and we've hired a nurse practitioner who will begin this month, Nicole Elmore. We're trying to have maybe one clinician not just do one assessment, but perhaps two assessments at a certain time. That may be a possibility. Working hard to try to reduce that cancellation rate and uh, trying to uh, sup uh, provide additional support with our nurse clinicians. And we've added Georgia Stobbs Kuki this past month, and Becky Cusinelli will begin later this month. But there are, you know, you are such a dedicated, committed group, and you are so well characterized with these biomarkers, it is natural that our affiliated investigators would like to study you because you already have such a rich data collection, uh, and it's very easy to just tap into them. These are not, uh, I mentioned there are many studies, but these are just some to give you an idea that are recruiting out of our Knight ADRC, Memory and Aging Project group of participants for additional studies beyond what I've talked about, beyond the amyloid imaging and the spinal fluid. Driving study, a towel labeling study, we'll hear from Dr. Sato, and uh, memory studies. And we hear feedback from you uh, when we call and say, would you be interested in participating in this additional study? What study is this? You've already contacted me a lot. I've got a lot of things on my schedule already. Boy, you guys are doing a lot of research. I don't expect you to see this, but these are all the additional studies that have requested access to you in 2016. So I think it's too much. Here's what we're going to be doing. Uh, one of our colleagues in the program of occupational therapy, Dr. Stark, is going to survey you to get, have you give your input as to what is the right level of us asking you for participation. And uh, this is a catch-22, right? I've already said that we're asking too much of you, now I'm asking you to do another survey. Uh, but I think that will be very informative. What, how can we support you better in your research participation? Dr. Sarah Hartz and Dr. Jessica Mazursky are going to inaugurate a pilot study that many of you have been clamoring for for years. It's a pilot study means we're just going to begin very circumscribed and assess the impact of the results of this, we're going to give back to you your brain MRI results. Uh, Dr. Mazursky is here, she's standing up, and she's going to be at the end of the meeting outside at one of the tables 
and please feel free to come talk to her about when this is going to be inaugurated soon and how it's going to run. We're launching today an opportunity for you. Only individuals enrolled in the Memory and Aging Project can ask an expert. You know how we have these cards, you're going to write down your uh, questions. We're not going to get to them all. So if you have questions about Alzheimer's disease, dementia, whatever, please ask the expert through our website. We'll get back to you. Do not make it a question about your own diagnosis or your wife's diagnosis. We're not going to dispense medical care through this website. So we can't do that, but please, we're giving you input direct to our experts. And we want to hear from you, not only through the survey I mentioned with Dr. Stark, but also we're establishing a feedback line. You can say, gosh, you are asking way too much, or I'm not treated well, or you should be doing this instead. We want to hear from you. One of the components of our program that many of you have expressed concern about is that paper and pencil testing of your memory and thinking. Dr. Jason Hassenstab, our neuropsychologist, wants to alleviate you from coming in because he will develop a program, already has developed a program, to test your memory and thinking at home through your smartphone. Here's an example. Oh, well, yeah, here's an example. So the, uh, you know, at a certain day or time of day, your smartphone will be engineered to give a signal and it will alert you it's time for testing. The testing will be very simple. Look at this. At the top half here, there are three pairs of different symbols. And at the bottom, there are two pairs. And it asks you to try to identify the match. What, what at the bottom matches what's on top. So you can do this. As, this can time whether you're correct and also your reaction time, how long it takes you to, 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 tell, to tell the correct answer. And this may be a much simpler way to evaluate your memory and thinking rather than having you come in for that paper and pencil testing. Guess what? Another catch-22. We have to implement this in addition to the paper and pencil testing to see which one works better. We can't just say, well, this is going to be the, the end-all. We have to prove that it's the end-all. We need more participants. We need to share the burden. So you can see our 2017 annual recruitment goals and how many we've enrolled as of mid-April. We're lagging behind. We would like you to advocate for us and bring in participants. Remember, we take people who do have mild Alzheimer's dementia, but mostly we take cognitively normal people. You don't have to have dementia or memory concerns. But we want people generally from 45 and up who are able and willing to have all procedures. There's our phone number. Please give us a call if you or you know relatives or friends who would be willing to participate. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. I think I've been over this. So I'm going to skip this. I'm going to skip that. Just point out, uh, I, I don't mean to be threatening, but these, uh, the first bullet point takes away some comments from our most recent review of our ADRC application. And it says to us here at the night ADRC, your follow-up rates aren't very good. You need to prioritize them. You need to bolster the numbers. You're below the median in, in terms of completing follow-up visits. Relatively no low number of people return for lumbar puncture. Fewer than desirable number and frequency of lumbar puncture. Remember, we've rested our hat on the biomarkers. We're pioneering, but if we can't go ahead and complete what we think we need to answer our questions, we won't get funded. Again, we won't get refunded. Your participation is critical to advance the field of Alzheimer's research. That's number one. Whether we're funded, wh whether we get the answers to preventing Alzheimer's disease or another institution, 
uh, it doesn't matter to us. We just want to stop Alzheimer's. But we think we're, as I said, leading the charge, and so we really would like your participation in our program. All right, so I'm going to show a very small clip of a video we're putting together to try to explain the necessity and the value of lumbar puncture, spinal tap. A number of participants are uh, helped with this video. This is only, what I'm going to show you now is only a small part. I don't think these individuals necessarily are going to be shown, but I want to uh, have the video played, and as soon as it, as soon as it ends, oh, that's Dr. Snyder. You're going to be hearing from her in a little bit. You, you, you can ask her just what happened over there. As soon as the video clip ends, we're going to have Pastor Doug Petty, who is the chair of our African American Advisory Board, come up to the podium and tell you why he participates. So, Ron, you want to play the video, please? The spinal fluid gives us a really important look, a window, if you will, into what's happening in the brain. We can actually analyze the cells of the fluid that's bathing the brain. So we can see how the brain is clearing the proteins that build up abnormally in diseases like Alzheimer's. So these proteins accumulate over time as we age. And once they accumulate to a certain point, there may be too much brain damage for us to really do anything that will be beneficial. So we're looking at the point at which we can intervene successfully before people have advanced too far and there's too much brain damage that occurs. We know that there are two proteins that Professor Alzheimer even identified back in the early 1900s that actually changed during Alzheimer's disease. One of those proteins is called amyloid and the other protein is called tau. Those proteins are in your brain all the time and they do normal things. And In the case of Alzheimer's disease, they start to clump up or they form big sticky aggregates. We do both spinal fluid analyses and we have images of the brain. Both of those things are valuable. The spinal fluid is particularly valuable because we can see the changes in amyloid and tau earlier, perhaps five to 10 years earlier than we can see the changes in an amyloid scan of the brain. The amyloid scan of the brain is useful because we can see where in the brain it's changing. The spinal fluid just says somewhere in the brain the protein is changing, but the image will tell you where it's changing. It's really important that we don't look at just one measure of functioning. So it's not just a brain scan, it's not just the memory and thinking tests. Um, if we can include bodily fluids and fluid measurement into that mix, that gives us a critical insight into how all of these operations are related. We're really concerned with changes within a person, within an individual. So it's not so much how your testing compares to someone else who might be um, much smarter or not as smart as you. It's not really about that. It's really about measuring change within a person. So it's really critical, and our study is one of the few in the world that does this, to have people come in time and time again, once every year, once every three years. And our participants are amazing because they, they do this. and. That's why we're one of the leading centers in the world at figuring out how these things change over time. The more we know about uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, the better off we all are. And to keep putting ourselves in the best position to learn more, but to increase the amount of participants that we actually have. All right, will you please join me in welcoming Pastor Douglas Petty to the podium. Doug? Uh, good morning. Good morning. I'm louder than you all are. Good morning. Okay, okay. I need uh, something to remember. Let me give you a word and I'll come back to that. R E, re. Just hold on to that and I'll come back to that several times. So, what did I just ask you about? Remember what? R E. But I said it's called re. Okay, let me, so what did I say you need to remember when I come back to you about RE? And what is it? And then what is, how is it pronounced? Okay, just checking, just to, just to be sure. Okay, just, just to be sure, just to be sure. Well, you know, studies are going on all of the time, just, but they're not all relevant for us. You know, for you, you may be interested in the mating habits of Japanese beetles, but not, not everyone. I mean, you, you may be. 
But there are some studies that have uh, tremendous relevance, and when we start to look at Alzheimer's uh, dementia, then it has relevance for, for all of us, uh, all of us in some form or fashion. Inevitably, uh, all of us will be impacted, whether it's directly or indirectly, because of a loved one. At some point in time, uh, all of us will be impacted. In fact, everyone in this room knows someone or who has been exposed to someone, and you may not have known it. It could be a judge, it could be an accountant. So, uh, And so research uh, is, I just used the word, there was this R-E, re, re, re. When you, when you hear re, and you think repeat, you know that means do something over again. R-E always says do it again. R-E means do it again. Repeat, you me? Repeat, re. Search. That means you search and you do it again. Follow me. R E. Search. Re. Now put search, looking for something. R E. You have to do it again. So, in order to be able to do it again, there is a need to have individuals available to re or do it again. And you follow what we're saying. Therefore, there's, there's the need for to do it again. So, let me use some liberties and then I'll talk to you about uh, why. Uh, I am involved. We need you to reach. So I will stretch re each. If each of you were to reach or re someone else to be able to be a participant, then we could reach more individuals. Re each of us could re some other individuals, which would expand the numbers that you heard Dr. Morris talking about, which would put us all in a better position to be closer to a world without Alzheimer's dementia. Does that sound like something we should be interested in? But you play a part. Are you following what I'm saying? If each did the RE again, then we could increase the numbers because each of you knows someone else who you could probably say something to. Now, I have uh, been a part of the lumbar puncture process. Maybe the terms are not very good. So Dr. Murray said, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help change our terminology while we're here. The original term said spinal tap. That doesn't sound too inviting, does it? Spinal tap. You say, oh, I'm not letting anyone tap my spine, right? You follow what we're saying. Nobody wants that. And then you say, puncture my lumbar. Oh, you know, that's awful, right? <laughs> I don't know how encouraging that is either. Come and get your lumbar punctured. You... Okay. All right. But reality is, maybe the terminology doesn't really tell you the story. Because I have participated in the process, and there's a, a, a sacks of fluid that doesn't necessarily bring your spine into the picture the way it perceptually appears. That's not necessarily the case. The closest thing might be a blood draw. Because you search for a vein. And you begin to draw out of a vein. Well, the, that this tap or puncture is really looking where the fluid is located to be able to pull it out the same way. The closest imagery that it can probably say is the vein that is used to draw blood. Would that be fairly accurate? That, that would be an accurate way of thinking about it rather than thinking that your spine is at risk particularly since I'm not the one doing it. So you're safe. So you find I, I will not be the one <laughs> that's, that's doing it. Uh, there are only certain individuals who have been trained specifically to go through the process that does not put you at any risk. I was actually looking forward to, and the process for me would have taken less than five minutes. And we talked the rest of the way. We're looking forward to some other things happening to be able to show you uh, the importance of all of us being able to take the next step because that is probably the highest portal to provide the highest level of information to put Dr. Mars and company in the best position 
to be able to project much further out. Would that be accurate to say? Because this becomes this this is the Bentley or, or the Maserati of uh, you know, I know the Firebird was OK, but we're talking the, the Maserati of <laughs> research to be able to do it. So uh, they're not paying me to say this to you. So this is just a person who's just like you. Who not only has been affected because I cared for my parents, for both of my parents. And, and I am a participant as a part of the adult child study. So I'm one of you. And what it is really helping you to understand, if we each don't R-E-A-C-H, we will never have the opportunity to get to the place where the fear of that dreaded onset is staring us in the face. So I wonder, and this is the pastor side of me coming up. Since right now you are officially my congregation. <laughs> and every pastor with any courage will always challenge the congregation. So your challenge. So you get the chance to lie or to be honest because this is what's about to happen. Will you commit to leaving here today? To say something to someone else, at least one person at least one person and I'm going to ask for a show of hands to say something to at least one person to emphasize why they are important to be a part of this process but here's the deal unless you are a part of the process do not say that to them make sure that you are and then you reach at least one other person and if each one of us reached one other person, the numbers that Dr. Morris talked about would no longer be an issue if each one of us. So let me come back again. I need to see the show of hands. This time I will pan the room. I will start on my left and I'm going to start looking around. So so don't pretend that you're busy and looking down and doing something like you didn't hear what I said. <laughs> so I, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking. We, we have about one 20th over here on the left with their hands up. So we're trying to see those who will. My hand is up. At least one person, at least one. And some of us talk so much we could talk to more than one person. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Doug, thanks so much, and thanks for all you do on behalf of the Knight ADRC and its African American Advisory Board. Uh, Dr. Chihiro Sato is going to talk about this unique study I mentioned earlier, the Tau Silk Study, and uh, she is um, working with Dr. Randy Bateman, as I say, cannot happen anywhere else except here at Washington University. Please welcome Dr. Sato. Good morning. Thank you for a kind introduction, and thank you for a great um, introduction to Spinal Tap of Dr. Penny, because it involves a lot of that. Okay, I'll, I'll try. Okay, so today I'm excited to tell you about our new study. Okay, all right. Um, today I'm very excited to tell you about this new study that officially started last year called Tau Silk Study. So um, in the Alzheimer's disease brain, there are two abnormal structures. One is plaques that is made of protein called A-beta, and another one is called tangles, neurofibular tangles, made by proteins called tau. So these bad proteins are increased in Alzheimer's disease, but is it because too much of this protein is made or too little is cleared away? So this balance is very important. So silk, or stable isotope labeling kinetic, is the only way to measure this balance, to see how much proteins are made and clear the way in hum humans. And more than 300 participants have already completed the silk study to look at one of the bad proteins, a beta, with Dr. Randy Bateman, who is my mentor. And this new study is about tau, the other bad protein. And tau is, this tau silk study is 
as uh, Dr. Moore said, is only available here at Washington University in the whole wide world. And this Tao Suk study is very important because it will help us understand why in Alzheimer's disease more Tao is, is present. And it will also help us researchers and doctors develop drugs that targets Tau. So what will happen in this Tau Suk study? So we will ask you to come back six times in four months because this Tau protein lives long time in your body. And the first visit involves overnight stay uh, infusion. And the, five, the rest five of the visit involves lumbar punctures. And the first three punctures are five to seven days apart, and the last two are months apart. So at the infusion visit, we will give you an amino acid, natural amino acid, called leucine, which is found in everyday foods such as nuts and meat. And we'll give you a heavy version of this. This is not radioactive and very safe. So in our body is made of proteins, and this is consistently uh, turning over. So new proteins are made every, um, every minute. And this amino acid will go into your body and incorporate it into the, the proteins that are newly made. And this heavy version of leucine will mark or label these proteins. At, and at the lumbar puncture visit, we will collect the cerebral spinal fluid that contains those labeled or marked tau. And this will give us information about how much tau is made and cleared over time. Because you're special to us, I'm going to share with you our very first data that we obtained from the first 10 participants. So this graph shows, the y-axis shows how much labeled tau is found in the cerebral spinal fluid. So the more tau, the higher. And the x-axis shows um, time. So as you can see, compared to the healthy patient, healthy participant, the ones with AD in red are, goes up like this. So it seems like too much tau is made in Alzheimer's disease. So the balance is tipped toward production. But we need more information. So we are looking for 70 participants to volunteer to um, participate in this study. 24 people has been enrolled. Some of you are right in, in this audience. And 16 people have already completed all five LPs. Amazingly, thanks to your commitment to this study, zero there has been 0% dropout, and 100% people have completed this procedure. So for more information, please meet our wonderful Tao clinical coordinators, Melissa and Melody. Where are you? There in the back. Yes, please stand up. They are our um, coordinators. Please ask her questions. And I'd like to thank um, my mentor, Randy Bateman, here, and the lab, um, the lab members, collaborators. One of them is um, Tammy Benzinger, who will be speaking after me and Dr. Morris and ADRC, and thanks to all of you for your, for your wonderful support. Thank you. So when uh, Dr. Sato uh, introduced uh, Melody and, um, and Melissa in the back, uh, you stand up again. Uh, so they're going to be at the end of the program outside at a table uh, perhaps with Dr. Sato to talk more for if you have questions about the Tau Soak study. I think I mentioned that Dr. Mazurki is also going to be out there to discuss a, the, uh, the uh, study in which we're going to return the brain MRI results to you. And at the same table is going to be Lori Delaney. Lori, are you here? Will you stand up so everyone can see you? Wave again. Who works with Dr. Stark to talk about that survey about participant burden. Also outside in the back, uh, Angela, there will be Tiffany Earle from the Memory and Aging Project. If anyone has any 
Questions about referrals or participation, Tiffany will be there. And at the fourth table, Angela? Oh, so uh, they'll have uh, coordinators from when Dr. Snyder talks about the uh, different uh, trial study, uh, investigational drugs that we're doing. We'll be talk, uh, have the coordinators there to talk more about that. Okay, so you've heard uh, in past uh, breakfasts from uh, Dr. Tammy Benzinger. We're delighted to have her come back and talk about a new study of uh, imaging to look not just at plaques and tangles, but now vascular lesions in the brain. Let's welcome Dr. Benzinger. Good morning. I'm so happy to be here today and to get to see all of you again. I really look forward to meeting you here every year. This is so important to us. I know we've talked about all of the many things we've been asking you to do, and this is one more potential thing you might be interested in. Um, and this is a really exciting study that is looking at uh, the relationship between what we call vascular disease and dementia. I think you, you all know we've been focused for a long time on Alzheimer dementia, but we know a lot of people have more than one thing going on, right? So people, people can have high blood pressure, people can have diabetes, people can have a lot of other things that can contribute. And this is looking at the way uh, our, our vascular system might be contributing to the Alzheimer pathology. What are we clicking on? So this is, a, this is a collaboration that we're doing here at the Knight ADRC, and we're actually doing this in collaboration with the University of Southern California, with Banner Health in Phoenix, Arizona, and also with the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And this study has joint funding from the NIH as well as from the Alzheimer's Association. We're going to try to show you a video introduction uh, from Dr. Zlokovic at the University of Southern California, who's really leading this coordination between the sites. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. Over 5 million people in the United States currently have Alzheimer's disease, and this number is projected to triple by 2050. Research is increasingly recognizing that damage to blood vessels in the brain contributes to Alzheimer's disease. Importantly, some recent studies suggest that vascular changes are detectable early in Alzheimer's disease, even prior to the classical pathological hallmarks, such as amyloid beta and tau. The human brain has over 400 miles of blood vessels. That's more than the distance from Los Angeles to San Francisco. All these blood vessels need to be healthy to promote proper brain functions. The vasculature transports oxygen, energy metabolites, and nutrients to the brain, and clears toxic products of brain metabolism to blood, such as amyloid beta. What research is missing from current studies to tackle Alzheimer's disease? We developed a multi-institutional program that is taking a new research direction by examining vascular contributions to dementia and genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, particularly the role of damaged blood vessels in onset and progression of the disease. We are investigating three main questions. Do cerebrovascular changes drive initial pathogenic events in individuals with genetic risk for Alzheimer's compared to those who are at a lower risk. What is the prognostic and diagnostic value of new molecular and imaging vascular biomarkers in predicting cognitive decline? Can therapeutic targeting of the damaged blood vessels early in the disease process influence the course of the disease? How will we study vascular contributions to Alzheimer's disease? This program project will study 750 people longitudinally at five different clinical sites across the United States. We will use cutting edge new methods to study MRI scans and measure proteins in spinal fluid to get a glimpse at the vascular changes occurring in the brain in people with genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. This enables us to determine how the vasculature changes with age 
and contributes to dementia and neurodegeneration. How will this study impact our understanding of Alzheimer's disease? The relationships between changes to blood vessels, connections between brain regions, and cognition have not yet been explored in humans. These studies may allow the discovery of new diagnostic tools, therapeutic targets, and potential new treatments within the vascular system to treat Alzheimer's disease. Furthermore, understanding how multiple factors and biomarkers of brain vascular, structural, and connectivity functions relate to each other and ultimately result in cognitive loss is timely and important. We are confident that the proposed studies will have a significant impact on our understanding of the causes, treatment, and early prevention of dementia and Alzheimer's disease, and will change the way in which we look at dementia and Alzheimer's today. You can help. By participating in research studies, you can be a piece of the puzzle to help find a cure for Alzheimer's disease. How can we contribute to this study? One way we're contributing is we're actually sharing the data that we're already collecting. So we already have brain MRIs, lumbar punctures, clinical psychometrics. So that, that's one of the reasons we were asked to participate is because we have such an amazing set of data that all of you have contributed. What's different is that with the MRI, there's a, a test called DCE, and that stands for Dynamic Contrast Enhancement. So with this MRI exam, we'll be adding a contrast agent called gadolinium. And also new, when we, when we do the IV for that contrast agent, we'll collect a small blood sample from that same IV. How much time does it take? We're really worried about how many visits we ask you to make, how much time things take. Our goal, our plan, is to try as much as possible to do this the same day you come in for that PET MRI study that you already do, the amyloid fluorbetapyr PET scan. Um, and this would add about 10 minutes to that scan, that visit. If we can't organize it to have it the same day that you're already in the MRI scanner, then we'll try to do it on the same day that you come in for that tau PET scan. So again, we'll try to, to do the test the same day. Unfortunately, if it's on that day, you'll have to get in the MRI scanner, and that might take up to about an hour. Um, if, so we really are trying to merge these and do it all in that one session if we can. Is it safe? So anytime you take a medication, by mouth, by IV, you really need to know what are, what are the safety issues with it. So the first thing is, if any of you here are pregnant and breastfeeding, <laughs> you can't participate, sorry. <laughs> uh, so we will, yeah, we will watch for that. Um, we do also check for your kidney function. Um, and so when we start that IV, we'll do a blood test. It's called a creatinine is what we check. And so if you know that you have abnormal kidney function or if you've had a renal transplant, you should not be in this study, and you can just tell us that ahead of time. Because we're doing this dynamic enhancement, it's, we're going to be injecting that contrast during the scan and there would be a risk of some pretty serious bruising at that IV site. Um, I say that because it's something new for all of you. I'll also say that this is a really standard thing we do at Barnes Hospital. It's actually the standard way uh, we do almost all of our clinical brain MRIs. So we have a lot of experience doing this, um, giving this contrast agent and doing what they call the power injection. Um, and then finally, uh, there's an unknown risk that this contrast agent, the gadolinium, might not clear out of the brain. This is something new that's just been uh, discovered in the last few years, that people that get these clinical brain MRIs will sometimes get a small buildup of that gadolinium in the brain. 
The FDA just this month actually issued a statement about this, um, actually saying that there is no evidence they can find that this deposition is actually harmful. And we also know that it's much more common with certain types of the gadolinium dye. And for that reason, two years ago at our hospital, we already switched the type of gadolinium that's being used to one that doesn't have detectable deposition, but it's still, it's still an unknown. So I just wanted to uh, give you this list, since you have the handout, of who are the study coordinators in our group. Um, these are the people that you talk to on the phone, that you meet with when you come in for your imaging visits. And we have uh, several people from the imaging team here today. Would you stand up? They're hiding. There's Austin. I saw Dr. Zaza. I saw Debbie here earlier. There's Debbie in the back. So you all have these cards. You can write down your questions. We'll have the panel discussion at the end. But also you should feel free to ask Austin and Debbie and Dr. Zaza if you have questions as well. And if they don't know the answer, they can come to me and we can figure it out. So thank you again. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Tammy. As Dr. Snyder is coming up, I, I want to uh, make three other introductions. The Knight ADRC is very committed to training individuals in uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. We certainly uh, want to develop and guide the next generation of researchers. And this summer, we have three uh, students who are with us, and I'll ask them to stand up. Susie Chen is from the St. Louis College of Pharmacy. Susie's standing up over here. Rachel Bailey is from Kansas University, University of Kansas. Where is Rachel? I guess she's in Kansas. Uh, and Lee Jarrett is from Tulane University. Is Lee here? Lee's standing up over here. And um, we put a lot of stock in doing the training and doing it in such a way. And I'm very pleased to indicate that this year, the, uh, the Washington University Academic Women's Network of faculty who are women uh, gave its Mentor of the Year Award to one of our ADRC faculty, Dr. Catherine M. Rowe. Kathy, are you here? Come on up. Let's <laughs> Kathy is just what she can't get up here. She's going the other way. <laughs> Kathy is just one of all of our people, Dr. Benziger, Dr. Snyder, Dr. Sato, do a terrific job in their, um, their mentorship. But uh, Kathy this year was recognized, so let's give her another round of applause. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Snyder is going to be talking about our drug studies, drug trial studies. Dr. Joy Snyder, let's welcome her. All right. Thanks so much. I have to, when we're talking about mentoring, uh, you probably should know one of the prior winners of that award is Dr. John Morris. Uh, so I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, uh, and I probably should say that in front of a pastor or two, but... Um, Alzheimer's disease is really a big problem, and, and you all know that. So this first slide is just pointing out, again, what a big problem it is, and the fact that even though we've been working on this for many years, many of you have been coming to help us for many years, we've learned a lot, but we haven't really moved the needle very much as far as people dying from Alzheimer's, and that's shown in this graph here, and a lot of diseases, heart disease, breast cancer, uh, many, many things like that, the, the death rate has gone down, and in Alzheimer's, it's gone up. And this is uh, from the Alzheimer's Association report for 2017, which just came out. Uh, so really, it's, it remains a really big problem and something that we continue to focus on and need to continue to focus on. Uh, and it's, it's here. It's in Missouri and Illinois. The numbers on the side of the people who died in 2014 uh, from Alzheimer's in our two states. So it's really uh, it's a big disease. It remains a big disease for all of us. So clinical trials. So a couple of key points, you've heard these before, but I think these are the things that we've learned from you over the years and that our center is famous for, 
is this idea of Alzheimer's disease being a diagnosis of the neurodegenerative disease, the things that happen in your brain, the plaques and tangles you've heard about today. And it has two stages. One stage, as Dr. Boris mentioned, is that preclinical stage when people are perfectly normal for 5, 10, 20, 25 years, but in their brain, the changes of Alzheimer's are starting. And that's pretty scary. Uh, the part that's hopeful about that is that means maybe we can treat it before the symptoms start. Maybe we can prevent Alzheimer's disease. The symptomatic part, the clinical part, is really probably the shorter part of the disease, but it's the part that we focused on in the beginning many years ago, but now, as, as Dr. Morris pointed out, over most of our participants are in fact in the, are normal. Some of them will be the people with the preclinical disease, some of them won't, and we're trying to understand that transition. And the other point that I think uh, was made when we talked about the uh, psychometric testing is that we're not, we don't really look closely at how people compare to the average person. Normally when you get one of these tests, we compare you to the average of all people your age. But what we know is most important, and what's most important to you, is not how you compare to some average person, but how you compare to you, what's changed about you. So we look at intra-individual decline. Okay, so you heard a little bit about PIB today, and you've probably seen this picture a few times if you've been to this meeting before, but PIB is a, a, one of these imaging agents we use in the PET scanner. Dr. Benziger mentioned we, we use these when you come in for your PET scan. And we can detect amyloid in the brain. Um, as was pointed out in the video, we can detect where the amyloid is in the brain, in addition to the spinal fluid telling us that there probably is some. And in this, let's see, where's my big red pointer? Ah, there we go. So this is a, a normal person on the left side. They don't have any amyloid in the brain. This person on, the, on your right, you see the bright colors. Um, that means they do have amyloid in the brain, so that's great. This person on the far side is normal too, but they look just like the person that has Alzheimer's disease. So this is that preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Amyloid's deposited, but the person is normal. And because of all the things we put you through in our study, we know this person is normal. They took those annoying pencil and paper tests and did all the stuff with the blocks that everybody hates, and we know they're normal. So that's what's really important about our study. That's why we put you through all that, so we can know for sure that somebody's normal. But three years later, this person did develop Alzheimer's. So again, it's a preclinical picture of the disease. We don't know yet if everybody that looks like this will develop Alzheimer's, but it's, it's made a big difference in how we approach treatment. Because of this, we can do prevention studies, as Dr. Morris mentioned. So we can look to see some of these people that have a positive scan. If we give them medication, will we prevent them from developing Alzheimer's? And the first study starting for that prevention was, as Dr. Morris mentioned, started at WashU looking at people with a familial form of the disease. But the next study that started was the study called the A4 study, looking at people that don't have a gene that causes the disease, but people that get it as they get older, the more common sporadic form of the disease. So the A4 study, and I can never remember the A's, so that's why I wrote it on the slide, um, is anti-amyloid treatment in asymptomatic Alzheimer's, A4. Started at our center in October 2014. It's a national study funded by the National Institutes of Health. We want to see if we can prevent memory loss in people with that preclinical Alzheimer's disease. So everybody gets a PET scan to get into the study, and it's the first time we have disclosed results of that PET scan to our participants. We disclosed it to people in the study because we had to. If you had a positive scan, you could go on and be in the study. If it was negative, you weren't going to be in the study. So only people with a positive scan were in the study. Um, nationwide, there are going to be 550 people who enroll, have a positive scan, and get a drug. Another 550 will enroll and get placebo. We don't know who gets what. We've had to screen 74 people at the night ADRC in order to enroll 15. So most people don't have a positive scan, so we have to screen a lot of people. We've enrolled 15, and we've now closed enrollment at the night ADRC. There are other centers that are open around the country. Probably will complete enrollment around the country over the summer. So this study is ongoing. We're very excited, but guess what? takes a lot of time. We don't find out in six weeks if the drug worked. It takes several years. So this study will continue for several years, and we may know if we can prevent some of those folks from developing Alzheimer's, which would be really exciting. The next phase of the study is starting, another study looking at a new drug. Uh, that's, they were going to call it A5, but I don't think they could come up with five A's. So it's called the early study. Uh, and again, same, same study design, can we prevent Alzheimer's? 
Uh, everybody has to have normal thinking, positive am amyloid scan. About 1,650 people nationwide. We're aiming to do about 10 to 15 at the night ADRC. We're getting startup underway. Uh, looking for folks age 60 to 85. Got to be normal, cognitively normal. You have to have a study partner, just like you do when you come to the ADRC. Got to have all the study procedures, the amyloid scan, MRI, the LP is optional for the study. It'll go on for four and a half years, so you have to be willing to come in pretty often for four and a half years. And we're going to randomize again to one of two doses of a drug or placebo, and this is an oral drug. It's got this fancy name, J&J, &J, 548, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we just call it a base inhibitor, but it's a drug that will reduce the amount of amyloid that's made in the brain. So we are looking forward to this. Two-thirds of people will get the active medication. We are in the startup process. Who's the coordinator for this one? Debbie Kemp. Debbie Kemp, is she here? Oh, Mark, Marga Marga Santos is the, Marga's here, I know she's. And she'll, and she'll be at the table. And she'll be at the table, and, and Maria's waving too. Okay, so they'll be at the table in the back if you want to learn more about that. We, I don't think we're starting enrollment quite yet, but we are getting ready. So what about people who have symptoms? We don't want to forget about them. We want to treat people who have symptoms as well. So I told you about two prevention studies. Now I'll tell you about a couple of studies for people who have symptoms. One is another one with a great name, LY3202626. We also call it a base inhibitor. It also prevents the amount of, reduces the amount of that amyloid that's made in the brain. It's a worldwide study. Uh, about 1,000 people we, will be enrolled worldwide. Uh, again, age 55 to 85, they have to have a specific mini mental state exam score that shows that they have mild memory problems. They also have to have the amyloid PET scan because we only want to enroll people who have Alzheimer's. So it turns out in the past, in studies before we had these scans in the spinal fluid, 10 to 20% of the people in, in Alzheimer's studies didn't end up having Alzheimer's disease which means it makes it harder for us to see if the drug is working. So now really any study for people with symptoms or not is going to include an amyloid scan or, or spinal fluid analysis. Folks in this study are treated for a year. What's unique about it is that the outcome they're looking for is changes in tau imaging. So you heard about the amyloid scans, you've heard about the tau that's in the tangles. There's a scan now that can detect that tau in the brain, and we think that may correlate better with the memory loss. It comes on a little later than the amyloid, so that's going to be the outcome in this study. Uh, we've had uh, 11 people consented at the night ADRC, six are randomized, three in process, and Debbie Kemp is the coordinator for that study, and I think she, she's not here. Oh, Maria. Maria's going to stand in, so Maria, Maria will be at the table talking about that study. Uh, the last one that is hopefully about to start, uh, is called the Engage or Emerge study. Uh, this is also a study for people with symptomatic Alzheimer's. And this drug, I can say this one, it's aducanumab. I don't know if you could see, can you guys say that, aducanumab? Yeah, maybe not. Um, or you can call it BIIB037 if you prefer. Uh, it's a drug made by Biogen, and it's an antibody against beta amyloid. So we've used a number of these in studies. Uh, this one, again, is a national study, actually international. 1,350 people will participate worldwide. We hope to have 10 at WashU. Same thing you heard for the other studies, age 50 to 85, mild AD, mini mental state score, amyloid scan at screening. Uh, people will get one of two doses of the active drug, which is an IV drug once a month, or get on placebo. So two-thirds of people will receive drug. The primary endpoint is something you might have heard about at this meeting before. It's called the clinical dementia rating sum of boxes. Uh, the CDR was invented here at, at WashU. The ritual paper had people like Boris and Berg and Coates on it. So it's a scale that we developed here, and it's being used as the endpoint to see how fast dementia progresses. This study is one we're very excited about because, um, as Dr. Morris, I think, said, this, this drug is kind of a game changer, perhaps, possibly, maybe, uh, because in the early phase trial, so preliminary data with this drug, this is the first time that we've seen a relationship between changes in the amyloid scan and changes in how people think. So we've always thought that the amyloid was a big part of the disease, but we've never really proved that it relates to the symptoms. And in this early phase trial of this drug, people who had a, an increase in the amyloid, a change in the amyloid uh, scan, which is shown in the red line, where they didn't have a reduction in amyloid, their CDR sum of boxes got worse, so their memory got worse. But people who had a reduction in amyloid on the scan, 
their CDR semaboxes didn't get worse. And these are people who were treated with the drug and we think it cleared the amyloid. So this is really exciting. This drug may actually work. We don't know. Many drugs have looked exciting in phase two and have unfortunately not been exciting in phase three, but we're, we're pretty excited about this drug having potential. So it, that's just pointing out the difference. So uh, Robin Haberman is somewhere here and Robin will be uh, yeah, at the table outside as well if you're interested in this study. Uh, we've got an IRB approval. We are going to have our site initiation visit in a couple of weeks, and then this study will begin. Other trials, you've heard about the dominantly inherited Alzheimer's network. That study continues to go on. The treatment trial is, is going on. Um, the one thing to tell you about this, although the type of Alzheimer's you have in your families is not the autosomal dominant inherited kind, the studies done at our institution enabled that study to happen, the spinal fluid studies, the amyloid imaging studies. So you made that study possible. Um, other trials that may start soon, uh, there's one of a drug called ABV8E12, uh, which is an antibody against tau. And this is exciting because this is the first study with a tau compound. Uh, this antibody was developed in part by Dr. David Holtzman in our department, so another WashU connection. Also includes amyloid PET, also once a month. That'll be coming in the next six months to a year, we hope. Uh, and again, CDR sub box is the primary endpoint. Um, right now, there's 191 trials active in the US, if you search online. The emphasis in these trials is on biomarkers to confirm AD and to look at changes. Many of them are looking at cognitively normal people. Uh, many of them have people with AD and we know they have AD. Many studies are using the CDR sum of boxes as an endpoint. And, and the bottom line is that we, we may someday be able to prevent or slow down the start of symptoms in Alzheimer's. Uh, we're using things that measure the brain disease now, not just report of symptoms. And we're moving now into the area of both amyloid and tau. So this is, this is really exciting times. And you, you made this possible through all the things you've done over the years at the 980RC. So again, thank you because you're the ones who, who made these trials possible. We don't have a world with Alzheimer's yet, world without Alzheimer's yet. We have a world with Alzheimer's, but we hope we will soon. So thank you for your efforts in making that difference. So 